The annual Shangri-La Security Dialogue has concluded, but what is the takeaway? Asia's top security summit attracted more than 600 delegates from over 40 countries and regions, including Chinese State Councilor and Minister of National Defense Li Shangfu and U.S. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. Each elaborated on their different vision of security architecture for the region, drawing wide attention from the world. There was also widespread speculation surrounding whether the two high-ranking defense officials would meet for talks. China has not agreed to grant such a meeting, citing a lack of sincerity on the U.S. part. But that did not prevent the two from shaking hands at the opening dinner under the watchful eyes of the world. Now, this year's security dialogue took place against heightened worries about possible collisions between the two militaries in the airspace over the South China Sea and in the waters of the Taiwan Straits. So what security concepts have the two countries laid out for the region? What, how different are they? and what uh, contradictions does China see in the U.S. approach? Welcome to a special edition of The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Xin. I'm pleased to be joined from Hong Kong by Professor Wang Jiangyu from the School of Law at uh, the City University of Hong Kong, from Riyadh, Saudi Arabia by Klaus Laris, Distinguished Professor of History and International Relations at the University of North Carolina at uh, Chapel Hill. He was also a visiting scholar at Harvard University and from Singapore by A. Song Oh, Chief Advisor of the Malaysian Pacific Research Center, who was at the Security Dialogue. Gentlemen, welcome to The Point. Let's first hear a little bit of a highlight from the Chinese State Council and uh, uh, National Defense Minister's uh, speech. He talked about China's new security initiative on June the 4th, which is the second day of the conference to a full house. He expressed China's willingness to work with all parties to enhance the commitment to an Asian Pacific community with a shared future and promote the sound development of regional security cooperation and strive to build an open, inclusive, transparent and equitable architecture on the regional security cooperation. Let's listen to one of the key phrases he uttered. Today, what Asia Pacific needs are big pies of open and inclusive cooperation not small cliques that are self-serving and exclusive. So I'm going to go to Professor Wang Jiangyu first. Uh, how do you understand this key message that uh, uh, Minister Li just uh, highlighted, that China is uh, uh, aiming for big pies of open and inclusive cooperation, but not small cliques that are self-serving and elusive? Who is he referring to? Uh. I, I think I, I watched uh, I watched uh, the uh, Mr. Lee's speech. I think he didn't mention the United States very explicitly, at least in the first part of, of, of his speech. But everything was very much uh, targeted at the U.S. I think he was referring to the U.S. You know, the uh, building alliance and uh, and uh, conducting military exercises and, uh, and also impose sanctions and also. The, uh, uh, the conducting very 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 dangerous military activities close to the Chinese the Chinese coastal coastal area, so that is the uh, basically the first part of his speech. But the most impressive part was actually his uh, the, his articulation of the uh, of the Chinese uh, global security initiative, so the the the, the, uh, the, the G GSI, that is probably so far uh, the most clearly articulated version of the uh, of this uh, Chinese proposal which is actually which is actually quite good I think it's very very uh, appealing at least to the global south uh, it will not be a surprise that it doesn't it probably doesn't uh, register very much in the US and 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 and, and, uh, and also in in the uh, in Europe which currently also subscribe to the American idea of, of security but it's very it must be very appealing to the global south because it emphasizes on cooperation and respect for sovereignty and also the uh, comprehensive security and also in this indiv uh, indivisible security i think those ideas do have a market in developing countries 
Let's take a listen to uh, some of the highlights of uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense Austin's speech. Um, he talked about, of course, uh, various subjects, but here are some of the highlights that uh, I would like to point out here. Let's listen to this. The United States is absolutely proud to expand our cooperation with ASEAN. We remain staunch supporters of ASEAN centrality and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. So, uh, Klaus, let me go to you. Um, some of the Chinese delegates actually challenged this point that he made, uh, saying that the United States is actually contradicting itself by uh, ostensibly upholding the centrality of ASEAN, but on the other hand, are building all kinds of smaller cliques, uh, such as AUKUS, such as QUAD, to counter a kind of imaginary threat in the region. Of course, we all know who the United States is talking about. What is your comment? Well, I don't think this is a contradiction. You know, when the United States says they want to support ASEAN, they may well be serious, but they are also, as you rightly said, have new organizations established with a number of countries in the region, such as Art, uh, such as Quad and AUKUS. What we notice from the entire summit, I think, is that uh, both Austin and Lee uh, talked to the Asian nations, tried to woo the Asian nations, tried to convince them that they are the right and the better partner in respect to the other great power, but that they really didn't talk to each other very much. And this is, I think, very regrettable. In a way, the summit seems to be a little bit of a missed opportunity. You talk to third parties, to the Asian parties, but you don't really talk to each other. And I think Austin and Lee should have engaged with each other uh, in a very constructive way rather than just shaking hands, be it in public or be it on the sidelines in a back room, just to talk to each other and to clear uh, clear the air a little bit because tension between the United States and China have been rising increasingly, including in the Indo-Pacific area. And I think both countries need to get together and talk. And it certainly couldn't do any harm. Whether a resolution could be found is, of course, uh, open. We don't know. But talking would be one step in the right direction. Direction. Uh, we will get to that in just a moment. This is a very important point you mentioned, Klaus, but again, on the centrality of ASEAN and the U.S. leadership in terms of uh, uh, strategic or security matters in the region, whether there is a contradiction uh, that the United States may not even be aware of. Let me go to Ai Song Oh. What is your perception, having watched, having listened to these speeches in person? Well, I think uh, this year's uh, atmosphere at the Shangri-La Dialogue has been much uh, toned down if you compare to the dialogues uh, before the pandemic, for example. And uh, talking about uh, ASEAN uh, centrality, so far uh, this notion has been played out in the sense of, uh, for example, ASEAN playing the role of host for a number of forums, uh, including the defense ministers forums and so on, such that uh, larger powers such as China, such as the United States, uh, could uh, indeed have some channels and lines of uh, communications. I think from the U.S. perspective, uh, they are reverting back to uh, building alliances uh, in, uh, in this part of the world. Um, after the Cold War, uh, the U.S. Uh, in a sense, uh, shall we say, half abandoned many of their previous military alliances. And during the Trump years, of course, uh, the U.S. was all going it its own cowboy way and uh, not liking to uh, align with anybody else, right? So I think the, the uh, Biden administration is trying to build, to rebuild those uh, alliances. And uh, from their perspective, they think that this is strengthening ASEAN's uh, role. But of course, uh, for ASEAN, uh, I think we are trying very hard not to choose side between U.S. and China.
Hmm. Uh, Klaus, what is your reaction uh, from the speech of Lloyd Austin? It seems that he has uh, uh, spent a considerable amount of his time talking about how the U.S. has stepped up power of partnerships, in his words, and how the U.S. has uh, been working with its selected partners to, quote-unquote, upgrade its force posture in the region. Of course, uh, he mentioned Japan multiple times, the ROK, the Philippines, uh, Australia, and India. India, so on and so forth. What is your take, Klaus? Yes, indeed. The United States has clearly emphasized uh, its Asian partnerships. It, if you like, it has rediscovered Asia as it has rediscovered Africa some time ago when uh, China became more active in the region. This is in a way only natural. It's part of a great power competition between the United States and China. But as far as the ASEAN countries are concerned, I think there is a great hesitation to, uh, to side with either great power very clearly. What we notice is really a multi alignment uh, of which many of these countries prefer they neither want to be close uh, they neither want to be uh, antagonize china nor do they antagonize uh, uh, the united states and i think from the point of view of the Asia, uh, asian nations this is, uh, makes a lot of sense because you don't want to antagonize your near neighbor which is china clearly still the region's most important economic and also increasingly political power but you don't want to antagonize the united states it's still the world's most uh, and greatest military power either, which is also still of uh, high economic interest to most Asian nations. And I think that multi-alignment, both China and the United States want to overcome. They want to draw as many Asian countries to their side as they can possibly uh, do. And I think that is what came across in uh, uh, Austin's speech as well. He is wooing the Asian nations, including Japan and the Philippines and Indonesia and many others. Professor Wang, do you see it this way too, that uh, this is what is uh, the competition between the United, and United States and China on security measures as reflected in the summit? Uh, thanks. Uh, first, a few words on ASEAN centrality. Uh, I, I, think there, there, uh, the, I think the, there are differences between the American approach and the Chinese approach here. Uh, it's, it's understandable that it's very hard for the U.S. to uh, truly respect ASEAN centrality in both theory and practice. The U.S. has much more important strategic partners in Asia Pacific, such as Japan, Korea, and, and India. And, 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 and I think the, uh, the ASEAN ranks much low, much low in, 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 that, in that system. I think the U.S. The U.S. very much does not want, want to deal with ASEAN as an as an as as the whole as an entity, the U.S. is what is is rather willing to deal with individual ASEAN countries. So the for one example, the uh, Asian economic integration process. So in the uh, about about twenty years, about ten years ago, so it was basically conducted by Asian countries. So in the form of either ASEAN plus three or ASEAN plus six. But the U.S. led the TPP negotiations, basically suspended the uh, Asian economic integration process and divided divided Asia. So the U.S. took some ASEAN countries into the TPP, but not other not other countries. Is so the United the, States uh, not uh, interested the, I, I, I in seeing? The US, hmm? Is the United States not interested in seeing ASEAN taking a central role, being more strategically autonomous, or is it just think that um, it's not so important? I think the answer the answer is the latter. I don't think the U.S. thinks the ASEAN is important enough. The ASEAN does not ASEAN as uh, as a whole does not have very strong economic relations with with uh, uh, with the U.S. and and also uh, as I mentioned, the U.S. has other much more important partners: Japan, Korea, and uh, and and, and India. I think for China, this is very different because the uh, China, uh, Japan, Korea, and India, they are U.S. They are they are, they are a bit geo geopolitically they are closer to the U.S. But the ASEAN is China's most important trading partner, right. and ASEAN is probably the only neutral party major force, the only neutral major force in Asia. So China has to take ASEAN very very seriously. Is China? So now comes the question: Is China trying to? Will ASEAN or win over more support of uh, regional countries to its side while the United States is uh, trying to keep them around the United States, as Mr. Klaus just interpreted uh, Professor Wang? 
I think that that can be taken for granted that so so given the geopolitical rivalry between U.S. and China, so both uh, U.S. and China want to woo other countries, want to establish some form of united front. The U.S. is very busy in terms of building alliance, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, surrounding surrounding uh, China the two Indo in the Indo-Pacific framework and the China, China uh, the the U.S. Japan uh, Korea alliance and 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 also quite a number of other of, of other organizations, including including AUKUS. So the and and China also has to reach out. So this is very much a continuation of China's good neighboring policy. It also very much conforms to uh, China's traditional policy, right? As long as countries don't uh, they respect each other's territorial security uh, and uh, and. Uh, 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 and, and, and sovereignty. So China would want to develop good relations with, with any country, mm. especially ASEAN, in this very, in this critical historical juncture. Yeah. So I think both the US and China are doing the same. The question is, uh, who can offer more benefits? Who would look more sincere? All right. Well, that is your interpretation. Uh, A Song O, oh, what is your perception of what China tries to do there vis-a-vis -vis what the United States is trying? Because the topic of the U.S.'s talk is United States leadership in the region. It is very clear what the United States is trying to um, accomplish there. But China seems to call for a different kind of security architecture that especially the word equitable uh, when you're uh, stressing such a word, it means that, you know, everybody talk about what is uh, going to happen in the region, or what everybody is going to do in the region in a, in a democratic manner, basically. Well, I think the China takes a more comprehensive look, a more comprehensive uh, posture when it comes to uh, regional security. What I mean by comprehensive is uh, it includes not only the traditional or even non-traditional notions of security, but also it encompasses, uh, for example, economic uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, it encompasses, uh, for example, cultural and educational uh, exchanges. I think uh, for China, it's not only you know a like joint military exercise and uh, arms sales and so on. It's also whether we could uh, increase our trading volumes. As ASEAN and China already trade a lot with each other, but now we are trying to deepen that, for example. I think from the Chinese perspective, uh, that's also part of uh, strengthening regional security. And I think a large um, portions of ASEAN would uh, actually agree with that. The United States uh, perhaps has a more, shall we say, single-minded or single-subject view on uh, the notion of security. Uh, it's uh, really, as we discussed just now, building up a lot of uh, military appliance, uh, sorry, alliances, but um, with very little uh, economic component in it. Huh? For example, the, the, the US, uh, they propose this thing called the uh, Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Framework, IPEF, yeah. but uh, I think it's about a year later we have yet to see whether there's any sort of, uh, well, real economic interactions un uh, under this uh, IPEF as proposed by the United States. Well, indeed, there has been some kind of negotiation which uh, has achieved uh, some kind of breakthrough in terms of supply chain or, or crisis response in terms of supply chain. But that is a different um, subject. I do want to uh, talk about uh, another issue which has been um, touched upon by both leaders, which is the security, the, the kind of uh, engagement or intercepts, uh, in, in the words of Austin, of Austin, the US uh, Secretary of Defense, he used such words such as alarming. He talked about alarming number of risky intercepts of US and allied aircraft flying lawfully in international airspace, but uh, that China has been conducting troubling um, he talked about another troubling case of aggressive and unprofessional flying by the PRC. But at the same time, the Chinese counterpart reacted by asking a question back. Let's take a listen to this. But I want to ask you, 
Here is another question. Why the problems that were mentioned just now happen around the area of the territorial waters and airspace of China instead of other countries? In Chinese, we say, mind your own people, mind your own warships, and mind your own aircraft. So, Klaus, again, this, is, this seems to be one of the most contentious issues, but this issue has been there for all the time. The United States believe that it is conducting lawful navigational exercises over these airspace or waters, but China believes this is not the case and that the United States should not be venturing um, too close even into China's uh, uh, territorial waters or airspace. Uh, what exactly is the problem here? Well, it is obvious that China doesn't like American ships or other ships coming too close to its territorial waters, as generally outlined. However, according to the American view, and indeed according to international law, the Taiwan Straits and the South China Sea are largely international waters. So the United States can send its ships through these waters totally legally, and there's nothing wrong with it. But China doesn't like it. It also says the legality is different. That is the problem. And I think that is the reason why the two men, the two defense ministers, should have talked to each other rather than giving public speeches and then gone away, essentially. They should have engaged with each other uh, behind closed doors and tried to sort out the problem. Because the danger of an accident by intent or simply by default, by really a genuine accident, such, an ac uh, such a danger is very, very high. And we never know what would be the consequences, the perhaps unintended consequences of such an accident uh, happening. So engagement between the two defense ministers and, of course, between the two countries at the highest level is totally necessary. So, um, Professor Wong, um, in reaction to this question, it seems that the United States is taking it for granted that it has the right to navigate wherever it wants, uh, wherever it can, um, um, including the South China Sea, including the Taiwan Strait, and China has to live with that, just like every other country so far. Uh, very, uh, very interesting point. I think. I think uh, here we see the clash of two narratives. So the Chinese narrative is the so the uh, almost all those incidents occurred because um, American military plans or the comes too close to either to Chinese territorial waters or too close to the uh, to the zone which China has designated for military uh, exercise. So the uh, uh, so the, the in the in the Chinese pers perspective. You should respect what we do because those are those are our areas and our interests. But the American American narrative is the whatever you do there, we don't care. And uh, so the uh, those are international waters, and I have the freedom to fly over any international waters. So you know, see, so this is the. Uh, it seems to be. Uh, so those that, th th those problems have been there for many many years. And I, 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 it's hard for me to agree with another speaker because the dialogue talk has occurred, has been occurring all the time for decades, but no problem has been resolved. So the, uh, the, the U.S., the China made many, many requests in previous talks with the U.S., but the U.S. didn't stop. Right. And, uh, and uh, well, the U.S. wanted China to exercise uh, the self-restraint to just let the U.S. to peak. Uh, the whatever China is doing and however close to Chinese uh, territory, territorial water. So you just don't act, no action, which China also cannot accept. So I, I don't think talk can solve the problem. I, I, I think there something else has to be has to be done. Maybe like someday. Mm -hmm. So yeah, maybe maybe someday you have you have you have you know, something terrible happens that the parties will truly begin to exercise self constraint. Well, Klaus, you want to react to that because uh, clearly our guest in Hong Kong does not agree with you. And, and also some people would say, what about China start conducting similar exercises of freedom of navigation of flights over uh, territories or airspace very close to the United States? Should the United States be living with that too or expect, you know, be expected to live with that? 
Yes, absolutely. Regarding your last point, if these are international waters and China wanted to uh, send its ships through international waters, that would be perfectly uh, fine, even if the United States didn't like it, if it was close to the American territorial waters. So I think the legality of uh, uh, freedom of navigation uh, exercises applies, of course, to both sides, clearly, not just to the American side. Regarding uh, what my colleague in Hong Kong just said, it is correct correct that the structural problem has been going on for many years. But we also have the UN Arbitration Court decision in 2016, which declared that most of the South China Sea was no, were not Chinese territorial waters. And I think that needs to be taken into account and needs to be uh, discussed. And as far as immediate discussions between the United States and China are concerned, at least uh, military communication channels would be opened again, should be intensified so that uh, 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 accidents between two military ships should not happen. Mm. That has very little to do with the fundamental problem, but it has something to do with really preventing accidents. And I think that is a short term answer to at least make sure that no military clashes occur. And here communication channels and direct talks are certainly very, very mm. helpful. Structural yeah. problem, yeah. fundamental yeah, needs to be sorry to too. yeah sorry to interrupt there we have a limited time i want to keep uh, some time open for our guest in singapore for his uh, intervention but i have to point out that uh, um the um first of all the united states is not a signatory to the UNCLOS, which is the uh, international treaty governing uh, you know international f flights and navigations in, in 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 international waters and secondly the tribunal in uh, concerning the the the, the legality or to, to whom the islands in the South China Sea or the waters belong is not recognized at all, which means that that court has no jurisdiction for matters concerning uh, national territories because China never agrees to grant that kind of jurisdiction to that court. So there is a big question there. But uh, A Song Oh, let me go to you. What is your reaction to um, the kind of uh, assumption or scenario that everybody will be flying their ships and sailing their ships, uh, flying their planes or sailing their ships to the territorial waters close to each other and thinking that that is going to be fine and uh, helpful to maintaining stability and peace. Well, uh, the United States has been uh, conducting such uh, freedom of navigation to, uh, well, operations uh, in this part of the world for quite some time. And uh, for most uh, ASEAN countries, uh, I think we are quite used to it. Uh, China being a big power, so of course, uh, doesn't like that a lot and therefore would have, uh, shall we say, more proactive uh, reactions uh, to that. Uh, just that when you do those uh, proactive uh, actions, well, make sure it uh, does not, uh, you know, uh, enable the situation to be escalated uh, further. I think it's uh, normal, for example, if uh, there's a military ship uh, sailing close to your territorial waters, then you have uh, some of your own military okay. vessels, uh, in a sense, monitoring it. But okay. to intercept it, I think that uh, has to be done very carefully. Mm -hmm. Um, I believe so too. A Song Oh, again, a final point. How do you look at the fact that China has not granted a meeting with its U.S. counterpart on defense matters? How is that perceived in the uh, in ASEAN countries? Keep it short, please. Twenty seconds, if you can. Yeah. Well, I think we look forward to uh, the U.S. and China to, uh, communicating more and to avoid uh, misunderstanding and hopefully certainly not conflict or clashes because we depend on these two countries for our commerce and for our trade. All right. We are going to keep a close watch on the situation. China is citing that uh, the fact that the, the United States is keeping the sanctions personal sanctions against uh, the Chinese Minister of uh, National Defense in place uh, means that the Uni United States is not sincere about wanting to communicate between the two sides. But let's see how the situation develops. Definitely China is talking to the United States. For instance, uh, uh, it is reported that the head of the CIA was in China in May and uh, Chinese leaders are going to meet with the U.S. Assistant Secretary of State for East Asian and Pacific Affairs, Daniel Crittenbrink. These are, of course, good developments.
Once again, many thanks to Professor Wang Jiangyu, Klaus Laris, and A. Song -o for joining us on this edition of The Point with me, Li Xin. As always, you can follow me on Facebook and Twitter using the handle Li Xin in Beijing. Thanks for watching. You've got the point.